Today, we're fortunate to have Alberto Cairo uh, talking to us about data visualization. Alberto is a journalist and designer uh, in the journalism school at University of Miami. And he's the author of four books that are very popular, How, How Charts Lie, The Truthful Art, The Functional Art, and Nerd Journalism. And he's also the director of the visualization program at University of Miami's Center for Computational Science. So um, he has also taught, consulted for companies and taught visualization classes for institutions such as Google, the Congressional Budget Office, and the European Union, Eurostat, the Center for the CDC, uh, the Army National Guard. And today we are fortunate to have him here. Well, he'll tell us a little bit about um, error, mistakes that people make when creating data visualizations or purposely bad data visualizations meant to fool us. So I'll, I'll get started. Thanks Alberto for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about your four books? Like what's the progression there and what, what, how are there main ways that they differ? Well, they differ a lot. All of them are, 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 are related to the design of visualizations. And, and as you know, I focus mostly on visualization as a tool for communication, not so much on visualization as a tool for exploratory data analysis. Although I, thought, I, I touched a little bit upon that in the truthful art. So the functional art is a book about design. It's about how to organize a story, how to tell a story visually. It's the first, first book that I published in the American market. The Truthful Art is essentially Stats 101, but taught through visualization. So it's like an introduction to sort of like this very elementary, extremely elementary descriptive statistics. But it's a book that I wrote for journalists mainly, to help journalists lose the fear that we often have towards numbers. And, and towards the exploration of, of, of data. Um, nerd journalism is the adapt it's an adaptation of my PhD dissertation, so it's an exp and it's available for free. It's an exploration of how graphics departments in, in news organizations have changed in the past 20 years or so. Essentially, sort of like um, telling the story systematically of the things that I have observed myself as a journalist, because before becoming a, a professor, I was a manager of graphics departments in news media. And the transition that we observed is that 20 years ago, when I began my career, graphics departments tended to focus mostly on visual explanations, right? Designing illustrations to explain things, right? And today, most graphics departments are much more focused on data visualization almost exclusively. So there have been a lot of changes in the, uh, the makeup of these graphics departments, in the philosophy, in the practice. So that's what I try to chronicle in the PhD dissertation. And then How Chats Lies, my first book for the general public. And the title is a little bit of a provocation because obviously it's not a book about how to like the chart. It's a book about how to become a better reader of data visualization for the for the general public. So yeah, they are related to each other, but they are quite different in nature to each other. Interesting. So I I'll, I forgot to mention to the audience, and I imagine we have some new new audience members given the numbers we're getting. Uh, that you, if you want to ask questions, please do it in the Q and A part of Zoom, not in the not in the chat. And I I will if you ask a question, I I will try my best to answer them. So good. That's interesting. I, I wasn't actually aware that you worked before you were, you had a real job before being. A oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I still, I mean, I'm still a practitioner. So uh -huh. I, I still produce data visualizations for clients. So besides doing consulting and training and giving feedback to people, I mean, I mean, organizations still hire me and to produce graphics for them, to produce dashboards and infographics. And so I still do that type of thing for a living. But yeah, I was the director of graphics in news organizations in Spain. I was a director of, graphic, of graphics of El Mundo, which is the uh -huh. second, second newspaper of in terms of circulation in Spain. I was the director of graphics for the online version of El Mundo. And I also worked in Brazil. I was the director of graphics at Editora Globo, which is the biggest yeah. group, of, group of communication down there for, for almost three years. So I directed, I, I, I managed visualization teams. And I also, I, I like to get my hands dirty. So I like to sure. design things. I like to so, draw things. So when you, when you started, what was, what, what were the tools available to you to make? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, oh, <laughs> if I told you, I mean, I, we, I, I, I used, and I still use mostly 
uh, tools that are common in the world of design, of graphic mm -hmm. design. So I, I use, at the time, at the beginning of my career, I used a lot Adobe Illustrator, right? Which is a, still a tool that I teach today and I still use today, which is because it's great for um, layout and for styling. So I still use Adobe Illustrator quite a lot. That's probably the only tool that I have used throughout my career. But at the beginning of my career, I use a lot of Photoshop, for example, just because I produce a lot of illustration-based work. I use 3D modeling uh, uh, software, which is, I still teach sometimes. I use Maya. I know how to model in Maya and I teach that. But right now, I mean, I, I, I tend to center my work a little bit more on data visualization. So I use anything from a little bit of R. So I am not extremely proficient in R, but you know, I use ggplot, I use the tidyverse to produce graphs and charts and maps. I use GIS software sometimes. I use a variety of tools. But then when I want to publish a graphic professionally, a print uh -huh. graphic, what I do is to whatever comes out of R or whatever comes out of any of those tools, I export it as a vector graphic and then I import it into Adobe Illustrator and then I style it in, a, in, in Adobe Illustrator to make it look more presentable and a little, a little bit more beautiful, to sort of like yeah. uh, make it look great. And then the I export art, it. The art part. The, the, the art part or the design part, which I believe, by the way, that this is one of the areas that statisticians and data scientists sometimes overlook, how important yeah. it is to make something look good. That's oh, not the icing on the cake. Uh, That's super it, important. It is. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that we overlooked. Is that we're not good at it and we don't have funds <laughs> to be an expert. But, yeah, but but we're trying. Some of us try. I know. I know. I know that you. I know that many, many, many statisticians try, and I know that because I train statisticians. So mm -hmm. I train data scientists on design skills, how to deal with typography and color and composition, and and I show tons of before and after. Right. Mm -hmm. This is what you come. What comes out of ggplot, which is good enough but then you bring it into adobe illustrator and preserving the sort of like the data that has been presented how to make it look even better how to change the colors how to put a good title on that so those are the skills that i believe are essential also yeah so when did you when did you make uh, uh, that this strong connection to statistics i mean you are you're pretty good. well just based on your tweets and, and other writings i can see that you're pretty well versed in statistics. When did you make that connection? <laughs> I, I wish that that were true. <laughs> oh, yeah. Compared to other journalists? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess that, but that is, a, that, that, unfortunately, that's a very low bar. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, but when did you make yeah. that connection and started getting more? Yeah, so, um, uh, all right, so I always liked math when I was in high school. Uh, in Spain, right, when you are in high school, you need to choose whether uh, studying what they call letters, which is humanities mm -hmm. or sciences, right? And some people go all the way to the humanities or all the way to the sciences. And if you study humanities, you don't study math. And if you study sciences, you don't study humanities. What, what grade it. is this? When does this happen? High school. Oh it my. happens when you are like 12 or 13. That's insane. Absolutely yeah. insane. Because I love history. If you take a look at my, at my, at my shelves over here, there are some tons of shelves about ancient history. I love reading about history, philosophy and stuff. But I always like math. So I decided when I was in high school to create sort of like a mixed path. I took a lot of classes in the humanities, but I kept taking math classes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I abandoned math and statistics when I get into college because I studied journalism and I forgot them for many, many years. And I started recovering them a little bit, uh, sort of like reading, you know, training myself and studying on my own, on my own. Around 2008 or 2009, I started recovering some of the old skills that I had lost. But I cannot claim any expertise. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I know descriptive statistics. I know, I mean, I know the language, um, but whenever I need to deal with actual statistics, like actually produce an analysis or whatever, I don't do it myself. I just yeah. collaborate with actual statisticians and data scientists and experts in the fields uh, that I'm studying. Mm -hmm. sure. But it was 2008, 2009, yeah. So here, I, a first question from the audience, which I'll paraphrase because it's similar to one of mine. So when you teach lay people or non-experts in data or, or, or data uh, summarization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are, what are the, like the main things you teach and what do you feel is missing from like the typical plot you see at people posting on, on say the social media mm -hmm. or, or in the press? Yeah, well, I, I teach, uh, so my classes are design and journalism classes. So it's visualization for communication, but I still teach certain skills that I believe are related to both design and also the thinking about the numbers. So for instance, I teach skills such as 
you know, be careful with aggregating your data too much. It's like, think about whether that average that you're showing in your chart actually captures the reality of the data. Look beyond that average, take a look at the distribution. If your distribution is very skewed, perhaps the average doesn't capture the reality of the data. And I show the students that, I show the students the average and then the reality of, of a very skewed distribution with outliers and say, you know, if you're a journalist and you only show me the average, you are not informing me. You are misinforming me. You need to show me the distribution. And, and, if, and, and then if you believe that your reader is not going to understand what a distribution is, explain it. Explain what a distribution is. So I sort of like try to teach communication students, journalism students, and, and design students very elementary data reasoning skills, such as that one. Don't oversimplify. Don't overcomplicate either, right? So try to find the right balance between showing too much and showing too little, right? And I show that on a case-by-case -case, uh, manner because I show tons of examples. Of no, I, I that's an example to, of skill. To, mm -hmm. to say that I, I'm really happy to hear that because I, my, when I teach data science or a basic statistics course, I, I have a data visualization section and in the and one of the books I've written, there's a whole chapter on data biz and mm -hmm. data distributions. That's where they sit. Mm -hmm. I put data, I put data distributions in the data visualization chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, and then people sometimes get confused about why, why is this here? Because it's not, it's not, but it, it, I, it's, I, I feel like it's, it's basically what defines mm -hmm. data visualization when it comes to numbers is, is understanding what, as you just said, that you, you, you shouldn't over, Summarize or under summarize too. You know, you can have the opposite can be true. Can as have well. both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show you a bunch of numbers both. without really. Yeah. The joke that I usually make in my classes, because in my classes, by the way, I forgot to mention that I have both communication and design students and also data scientists. So I have data science students together with science. And, and what I usually joke is that journalists and designers, we tend to oversimplify things and only show you the average or the national rate without paying attention at the granularity of the data. And data science scientists tend to commit the opposite sin of showing too much, mm -hmm. right? So I say, you know, you need to find the middle ground. And need, that needs to be based on a, on a case by case uh, manner. It cannot be, there are not just general rules, right? They're very vague rules, but you need to take a look at it case by case. So I have a question here from the audience asking if, what specific tools you use to make the graphics in your book? Um, you can find that in my website. So if you go to the title of my first book.com, which is thefunctionalart.com, on the upper right corner, there is a tutorial section. And there I have a little diagram uh, that I drew. I can actually share my screen, right? So I'm going to share yeah, my yeah, screen. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to share my screen because then people will be able to see. I, I am sort of a, a dinosaur, though. So I, I still use many you know, tools that have been around for many, many years. So if you go here to tutorials, right? This is the functional article. And, and, and can you put that? Actually, I can do it for you. Um, yeah. Because people want links. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's thefunctionalart.com, which is yeah. the, the, the title of the first book. I'll put it and on then, the Q&A. Yeah, the Q&A. And then tutorials. Um, here I post tons of video tutorials that I have recorded for my students. I post them online for free. So I have tutorials about Excel, Adobe Illustrator, Flourish, Raw Graphs, got tons of tutorials about different tools. And this diagram summarizes what I use tools for. So when I'm doing cleaning or exploration of data, I use any of these, right? I still, as I said before, I still use R. I also use R to generate some plots. So R should also appear over here, but I use a huge variety of tools to generate base graphics. But as I said, I never publish the graphic that comes out of R directly. Mm -hmm. What I do then is to export whatever comes out of any of these tools as a vector file. And then I bring it into Adobe Illustrator and then I make it look better, right? I actually make it look professional and publishable. And then I export it as a, as a PDF. So that's sort of like the process that I follow. Obviously the problem with these is that it doesn't, it doesn't make the graphic reproducible, which is uh, something that data scientists need. So they, a data scientist better stays at the R stages, right? Produce everything through code, just because you want to, to make your graphics um, be reproducible by other scientists. But the types of graphics that are produced are just one-time graphics that you're going to put on a paper or on a poster or whatever. And, and then you don't need to make them reproducible or 
you just just can just release the code and then put put the pretty graphic in the publication. So that's the reason why I follow those follow those steps. Yeah, except if you find you find you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> then the you first. need to then you need to go back to VR and repeat the process. And, and, then, the whole... and then but once you have restyled a graphic, yeah, it's not it is very hard. easy to just clone stamp the uh, sort of like the styling that you have produced. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually yeah. quite fast. It's not that bad. I, I yeah. have, it's I've a seen. very manual process, but if you get very proficient with Adobe Illustrator, you can repeat those steps very quickly. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about some of your favorite examples of, of people lying with with um the charts and maybe show us some if you have them? Yeah, um, I, I actually, when, when we first talked, I put together sort of like, oh, by the way, this is a, an example of the types of graphics that my students produce. So I teach my students how to you know, design to this level, right? Something that can be published almost right away in a newspaper or a magazine or something. It's an example by a student called the Pan Davis or, or these. I also teach my students how to draw a little bit, how to draw icons and pictograms Right, that they can put in like in charts and infographics. Uh, so I have many examples of lying charts. So as I said before, how charts lie is really not a book about how to lie with charts, or even about charts that lie in purpose. It's more about how we lie to ourselves with charts, how we see what we want to see in charts, and how to how to avoid that. But there are several examples of lying charts. For example, this is one one of favorite of mine. So this was uh, put together by a group of uh, climate change deniers, saying, well. <laughs> Temperatures in the world have not changed that much in the 19th century, right? This is uh, in Fahrenheit degrees uh, scale. I mean, this is obviously very absurd because, first of all, the Fahrenheit scale doesn't have a zero baseline. And also, well, some people joked about this example. I, I explained this in more detail in how chat side, but some people joked on Twitter about this, saying, yeah, well, if you want to play with the scales, let's show the national debt. <laughs> the, the US national debt also with that type of, that type of scale, right? Hmm. And some people joke this way, saying, well, yeah, but you need to consider these, right? That a small variation on, on, on global <laughs> temperatures may take you to hell on earth, essentially. So I use examples like this to explain to people that data visualization is as much a science I as like it is one. also an art. Because choosing the scale of a graphic like this actually requires you to take a look at the data itself and understand what a meaningful change is. Sometimes absolute change is meaningful, right? But in this case, absolute, absolute change looks very little. It's just two degrees in the past 100 years. But two degrees is extremely significant. So you better exaggerate the difference in a way that, that sort of like mat matches that, that, that significance in that variation, right? A couple of degrees of increasing temperature is actually quite dangerous, right? And we are headed in a, in a much more dangerous in a, in a much more dangerous path. So this is one of my favorite examples, right? Also, the, the map that I have at the beginning of the book, the electoral map, right? It's like um, the uh, 2016. Oh uh, yeah, that was, yeah. That was, that went viral. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, just because uh, President Trump li likes to tweet it, and this this map uh, misleads a lot of people because uh, this is a map. There's nothing wrong with the map. And I made this clear in our chat slides. The map itself is not wrong. The map itself is fine. But if you understand what the map is for, because visualization is always purpose driven. In order to critique a visualization, you need to, dis you need to know what that visualization is intended to show. What this map is intended to help you with is to see who won where, and that's it. Right? Who won where? And you can see that. The problem is that many people that are using, and there are many people out there who are using it to talk about popular vote, right? So and you cannot use it for that because it looks like an ocean of red and sort of like little splotches of blue just because democratic vote tends to concentrate in highly urbanized areas and Republican vote tends to spread out over sort of like more sparsely populated areas. And many people misinterpret this map this way. So this is a map that lies in the sense that people lie to themselves with the map because they see on the map what they want to see right? right i mean that map is really showing where the cities are and where black people yep. live in the south yep. <laughs> but the map itself is not a problem the, the yeah. problem is how mm, we project Texas. how we project our beliefs onto the charts that we see yeah yeah, yeah. interesting very nice okay so um what about do you have any thoughts on the common mistakes made by academics or biomedical and specifically our, our um, area, biomedical mm -hmm. uh, literature and science? 
No, not necessarily mistakes. Uh, well, first of all, let me, when I call out mistakes by other people, I always perceive that by saying, this is something that I have done myself. So I know what, where you come from. But, you know, um, one thing that I see quite a lot among academics, and more specifically in academics in public health, in biomedical sciences also, is that um, data science in general, I would say, is, as I said before, that we tend to believe that com clear communication is an afterthought or that making a graphic look good is an afterthought. It's the icing on the cake. I just care about the data, right? I just care, I'm a serious academic. I don't care about all that, you know, beautification or whatever, right? I just care about the data. And if I have time, you know, I will sort of like polish the graphic. No, no, that's not how things work. If you want to communicate clearly, you need to care about style. You need to care about how things are presented to people because you want people to take a look at your graphic so you need to make your graphic look good you certainly need to prioritize presenting the data you need to show the data but then you need to make the data look nice that doesn't mean decorating the graphic or putting tons of illustrations but you need to pay attention to color composition white space margins alignment all those are design skills that can be learned and can be taught. And I know that because I, taught, I teach them to scientists, right? It's like, and they are, not, they are not that hard to learn. They are learned through, somebody needs to point them out to you. And then it's just a matter of, just a matter of practice. So I sometimes help uh, students in the sciences, for example, to redesign their science posters that they take to conferences, right? And I, show, I sometimes redesign those myself and I show them what they designed and then what I would propose. And then I, make, I, I compare them to each other. And I point out, it's not that you did it wrong is that nobody taught you these skills. So it's normal that you don't know how to apply them because this is similar to writing, right? If nobody teaches you how to write correctly and how to sort of like turn out a phrase really nicely, right? You will never learn, right? Then you need to put it in practice, right? So that's one of the most common mistakes. Uh, and and um, then the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is also quite important. Not being able to adapt your message to the audience that you're addressing. That's mm -hmm. extremely, extremely important. And it's yeah. a very, very common mistake. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So, uh, what which for your, of your four books, which one would you recommend for a a biomedical scientist that is, is who's wanting to improve the plots in their papers? Probably. All right. So, even if it is the sort of like part of the book will be extremely elementary for someone who has a training in statistics, I would probably recommend the truthful art. Okay. Because it contains tons of charts that you can sort of like copy, right? Yeah. In terms yeah. in terms of style. I would gallery. Probably, yeah, the gallery. It's a gallery of graphics you can take inspiration from. Yes. Nice. So there's a related question from the audience. Someone that wants to uh, learn information design, mm -hmm. uh, and he want this person wants uh, to if you can recommend some books or where to learn it. I don't know if we can maybe later put a link there, or if you want to say something right now. So information design in general, not necessarily mm -hmm. just data visualization. That's what they're asking, yeah. Yeah, there are many books out there. For example, there is um, Isabel May Regis. I can type it on the chat window. Um, in the Q&A window. In the Q&A? Okay. Or wherever. Uh, I can copy and paste if you don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that I can write in the... Um, uh, I, I will put it on the, on the chat. So Isabel May Regis. Isabel May Regis is the author. And the, the title of the book, the book is Design for Information. So that will be a great starting point for if you want, you know, information design in general. The, the meaningful structure in information to enable understanding. That's what information design is about. And data visualization is a subset of information design in general. As an introduction for, to, to data visualization, right, in general, a very elementary, but also very readable and, and I believe quite engaging, I would recommend a Klaus Wilkie's um, data visualization book. I don't remember Klaus's book title, but the author is Klaus, Klaus Wilkie. So you can, and, and this one is available online for free. Um, I think that is data visualization and introduction or something. I don't remember the title, but it's really, really good. And it's, it's R based, right? So they, and the, the graphics are reproducible. Klaus Wilkie, and then Cole Newsbummer's book, a Storytelling with Data, is also a good introduction to elementary data visualization called Newsbummer. And uh, so Cole has this very nice book, uh, again, basic data, basic data visualization. Uh, so those are the ones that I would, I would recommend just to get started. And then those books will lead to more books because those books recommend other books, right? So right. yeah, I will begin with that. 
Yeah, I would. I was going to add to that to the the biomedical literature, also general science literature. I I feel like it has been it has been affected by Excel. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's certain there's certain certain types of graphics that show up a lot, and mm -hmm. and it's if they're not they're clearly not the best ones, and they just become like you have to make a mm -hmm. dynamite plot, you have mm -hmm. to make a pie yeah. chart. Uh, and then Which, it's very I'm hard to, to, <laughs> oh, we're going, going to talk I'm about that. To, I'm going to interrupt you in there. So okay. you asked me before about, about common mistakes. And, and yeah. this is a, a general mistake. One general mistake is to let the software make decisions for you. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, one thing that I want students to have jokingly every semester is that I don't want to be able to tell which tool you used for this visualization. Mm -hmm. Because then it will tell me it was not a person who designed a visualization, it was a computer. And I don't care about computers. I want people talking to me and explaining cool things to me. Uh, so I want to get a sense that there's a person making decisions. So you better not use the default styles of that tool or the default options of that tool or sort of like be driven by, by the constraints that the tool imposes on you. You need to control the tool to apply good visualization principles and good visualization practices to the usage of that particular tool. So that's a very common mistake, but that's everywhere. I mean, it ails also journalists and scientists of all kinds, etc. Yeah, I guess it, uh, your answer one of my questions, which is is to get your thoughts on the ubiquity of bad charts like donut plots, dynamite plots, pie charts, and then 3D, mm -hmm. uh, gratuitous 3D. Gratuitous 3D, right? So 3D is a very a very common problem. You see all of these these perspective types of graphics, etc. All right, one, one one key rule in design that I teach students is similar to a key rule in writing. If something is not needed then it is not needed. <laughs> Don't add it with no need. Uh, the way that I teach is like, if there is a feature in your graphic, to, take a look at the graphic that you have just designed and take a look at the features that make up that graphic. If there is a feature that doesn't make your graphic clearer or makes your graphic more beautiful, right? Then it's not needed. There are some features that make your graphic look better and, and that makes your graphic clearer. If it doesn't accomplish any of those, then just get rid of it because it has no, no reason to exist. And 3D is an effect that sort of like doesn't fulfill and it doesn't make your graphic look better. It looks horrible, probably. And it also, it also makes your graphic even, I mean, worse, less clear. Therefore, it, that's even worse. Just get rid of it, right? Now, pie charts, I don't mind pie charts. So there's a lot of myths surrounding pie charts. These all began in the 80s um, with a... Professor Edward Tufte's books, and we said, you know, oh, uh, the only thing worse than a pie chart is several pie charts, something like that, right? <laughs> well, a donut plot is worse. Donut plot, yeah. But <laughs> the problem with Tufte, uh, uh, as good as his books are, and I still recommend his books as sort of the landmarks in the field, they are excellent, really well written, is that it's easy to take Tufte too seriously. And, and or, or too literally, seriously, too literally and too seriously. And what I always recommend people is that never take authors, including myself, too literally or too seriously. Because sometimes we write these sort of like clear cut sentences. It's like, this is the law, you don't do this or don't do that, right? Now pie charts, they may be a property in some, in some contexts. And it, it, when you want to show half versus half, and I have tons of examples of that, right? You have a pie chart with 10 segments, but nine of those segments are less important than the main segment, right? A pie chart is fine because you can click, and it is not worse. And we have, we have actual experiments showing that it's not significantly worse than a bar graph. So if it is not significantly worse than a bar graph, there is really no difference between using a bar graph and a pie chart. Therefore, if you prefer the pie chart, just use the pie chart. There's no, really well, no there difference. Is one, there is one difference though. Like it's uh, that we, the, what is it? The, Visual cue length is a much better visual cue than angle. Uh, if you area, if you area. want if you want to compare things accurately, yeah. But sometimes yeah. the purpose of it. Remember what I said before. Visualization is always purpose. Got it. Yeah, yeah. No, if right. the purpose is not accuracy, then the, if the purpose is the general picture of the data, getting a big pattern of the distribution, sort of like the the parts of a whole, the pie chart may actually be a little bit better in some cases. So yeah, that's what I, that's the opinion I formed about pie chart, and, but in part because we've been. We see them so much that we know what it is. Like everybody knows what it is by now, mm -hmm, I, if, mm -hmm. as opposed to a bar plot, which is not mm -hmm. not as ubiquitous. But that is what I think now that there's that if I just give someone five seconds to look at uh, a pie chart and a bar plot, 
-hmm. and then I take them away, uh, they probably will have a better understanding. Yeah. Of yeah, the, better recall, better recall of the pie charts is because. But if, but like you say, if you want to actually mm -hmm. know the numbers, and which is, which in science we almost always want to, so you always want. But as I said before, yeah, yeah, visualization yeah. is always purpose driven. So if yeah, the yeah. purpose is accuracy and comparison, etc., then go with the bar chart or any chart that uses a length or height or position to encode the data. The pie chart uses angle and area, so that is not that accurate. But it may be adequate, it may be appropriate in other circumstances, in other cases. This is the type of skill that I teach my students. Because for many, for many years, visualization has been taught as, a, as something that can be based on rules. Don't do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. That's not how to teach visualization. Visualization is more fluid. Visualization is more similar to writing. We don't know writing by applying clear cut rules that are appropriate regardless of context, right? Visualization needs to be taught as a process of reasoning of justified reasoning. I am doing this because I have this reason, this reason, and this reason. I'm not doing this because of this reason, of this reason, and this reason. And then you need to weigh the reasons uh, in favor or against making a decision. And then you take the decision based on that weighing of reasons, right? So that's the way I process information. So I don't use pie charts that often, right, myself, but I have used them uh, in certain very specific cases if they are adequate for that particular message, for that particular purpose, and for that particular audience. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you, you alluded to it earlier, but I, in my daily work, I analyze data. That's what, what I spend most of my time doing, wrangling or analyzing data. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, I don't know if, if, if non-data analysts know this, but it's, we spend a large percentage of our time, maybe more than half the time, looking at looking at it in different ways. So it's it's like data exploration is is I think as important if you're going to be a data analyst as all the other things that inference and probability. It's it's just as important because you will undoubtedly miss important aspects of your data. Or your or you'll fit a model that doesn't really fit. I mean the the reasons are countless, but there's there's definitely a distinction. So, so one thing I've, I've, I've seen trainees do that maybe is it, it slows them down is that they'll, they'll try to make their exploration that plots just as not, using the same techniques as, as we used to uh -huh. then show them to the public. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this distinction. Yeah. I, I think sometimes that people, because we use the same language sometimes to describe this mm -hmm. data visualization, Mm -hmm. It gets confused, and I think they're two very different things. Like mm -hmm. exploring data, making plots to explore data, and then making plots to communicate your mm -hmm. findings are are two very different exercises. Mm -hmm. I, I I talk about distinction in both uh, the functional art and the truthful art. That we have visualizations that are intended to communicate messages to other people, and visualizations that are intended to discover messages yourself yeah, or right. in the data, right? I mean, the famous statistics, this is not a new thing. It's like right. we, have, we are not reinventing the wheel. John Tucky, John Tucky in the, um, in, the, in the 60s and the 70s used to say, always visualize your data when you're analyzing it, when you're exploring it, because otherwise there may be patterns patterns and trends or things in the data that you will not notice unless that you visualize it. One of the most popular things that I have ever created, I don't know whether you saw that, um, to, I made a joke once um, a, a saying, I, I created a, a device called the data source, right? Oh yeah, I, I, yeah. you saw that. So I, I drew a dinosaur, right, yeah, yeah. with a with a free tool, right. I, I I drew a dinosaur in a scatter plot, right, and then I provided the data. And it's an example that I use sometimes as a joke to warm people up in, in talks. And as oh, as as <laughs> it has different yes. names. But if you Google Alberto Cairo data source, you will find it. And yeah, the yeah, data set is publicly famous. available. Yeah. So I, I drew that, and then then some people from Adobe Research created other visualizations based on the same. They, are, they created other data sets with the same summary statistics, yeah. and they have very different shapes. Just to make that point, right, it's like, obviously that is not, statistically speaking, is not very interesting because the data is completely sort of like random, right? But it still makes a point, right, that if you don't visualize the data, you will miss the dinosaur in the room, right? So always visualize your data. But Toki said these, Tufti said these for many, many years, and modern practitioners of it. I mean, if, if you get Hadley Wickham's R for Data Science, right, the famous free book, R for Data Science. What is the first chapter about? Or the first few chapters about? Visualization. 
just because visualization is a great entry point, right? So the difference is though, when you design a graphic to explore data, it doesn't look, it doesn't need to look nice, right? It just, just come, it can just look like crap. The only thing that matters is that you can see those patterns in the data. And there are plenty of tools that you can use for these. R is great, Tableau is great. There is even a tool that was designed, created by the Department of Statistics at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, the, the, the same sort of like department that created the, the R programming language called Insight with a Z, Insight. You can Google it up, it's free and open source. So Insight is a, is a shiny application it's a graphical user interface that generates R in the background. And apparently, as far as I know, they created that tool to teach statistics to high school students. So high school students could, could fall in love with the statistics because they, they introduce statistics visually by exploring data. Take a look at how cool it is. We can see all these patterns in the data. They don't talk about the mathematics at first, right? And that's a strategy that I usually use, a little trick that I use to teach people who fear mathematics to teach them mathematics, teach them the visual thing first because you will get them excited. But again, that explore, exploration part, the graphics don't need to look that great, right? It's like you just need graphics that are clear enough for you to see the possible insights, right? Uh, patterns in the in the data, right? So yeah, there's that that distinction. That, that, that distinction exists for sure. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, definitely. So uh, how do you keep uh, up to date with the developments data visualization uh, i'm just typing here the name of the tool that i have just mentioned in the in the chat window um so how i keep up um yeah, like what are what's your ways to, to i i use i use twitter so i try to follow i use twitter as a as a work tool right so i i, I tend to follow people who are who post regularly about about data visualization I follow weblogs. Um, I, I just try to try to keep up with the people who with people who put stuff out there. And there's so mostly no answer. mostly through social media. It's mostly social media. Yes, I don't. I try to read also research papers that 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 I put can put my hands on when, whenever possible. Um, so yeah, I, I use different ways. I don't have a sort of like specific sort of like system or it's like I just follow people. I follow other people and see what it is that they are doing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I know that there's well, something that's finally coming to fruition. I've, I've wanted this for a long time since I started analyzing data 20 some years ago, which are these interactive plots with, that give you yet another dimension to work with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, um, you know, that, that, I can, that, that, that's moving fast. Yeah, it is moving fast. There are many technologies that are moving fast. I'm also super interesting about the possibilities of using um, augmented reality and virtual reality, not necessarily for data visualization, because I think that visualizing data in 3D space and sort of like immersive environments confuses people more than clarifies people, at least for now. Perhaps someone will come up with a great solution for that. Well, you know, Tuki used to say that we don't see in three dimensions. We don't see in three dimensions. But I'm like super- 2.2, he had some yeah. So I don't know. I don't know whether it will be, those techniques will be useful for data visualization. But for information design, that is different because creating virtual environments, right, that you can explore high resolution. I once saw a simulation of a human heart right, in 3D, and you could walk inside. So that's scientific visualization, right? It's the uh, mapping yeah. of reality on a 3D space. You could walk inside the heart and actually take a look inside. That was, in, that was amazing. So the possibilities are, are incredible. So yeah, I try to sort of like, try to keep up with all that stuff, see what's going on. I don't necessarily sort of like get involved in those types of things because I'm less interested about, I'm less interested in um, technological innovation as I am in spreading the knowledge of about what we what we already know, so I'm much more interested in democratizing basic data visualization and bring the entire public up to speed. That's what I wrote. Why I wrote how chat slide, than sort of like focusing on the high end, like the high end technology and stuff. There are tons of people working on those. They are super talented. I don't think that I can contribute much to that, but I can communicate. I can explain things. So, I, I, perhaps I can contribute with that. So any final thoughts to share with the data science audience? Sure. I mean, yes. I mean, get, uh, try to fall in love with visualization. It's like once you start using visualization, you will never stop because it's a technique that, again, as you said, I mean, it will help you discover things that you, I, I usually compare visualization to a pair of glasses. So if I take my glasses off, 
right? I don't see things clearly. But if I put my glasses on, right, this sort of like mediates between the world and myself, and it lets me see things clearer and in a clear manner. And visualization is great for that. Not only that, it's also a tool for better reasoning. Visualization, like writing, when you write, right, when, and you, as you know, when you write, you don't write just to communicate. You, we sometimes write to sort of like organize our own thoughts, right? To think better. When I write a book, I actually think better about the material that I'm covering. I use book writing as a way to think deeper uh, mm -hmm. about the issues that I care about. Visualization is very similar, right? When you start using visualization on a regular basis, you will notice that it expands your horizons. You discover things, paths of exploration or research that you may not have noticed if you have not visualized your data. And then also think about visualization as a communication tool. Again, you know, think about that the way to communicate with other people is not just through words, although words are really powerful. We are usually much more effective at communicating with we, when we combine words with visuals, right? With graphics that sort of like show the evidence of the claims that we are making and care about design. Don't think that design is an afterthought something that you can put at the very end. If I have time, I care about color. No, 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 no. Style. Care about the style if you want to communicate clearly because otherwise you will not capture other people's attention. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. This is very enlightening and entertaining. Um, and I hope to see you soon in our Zealand Symposium, which is coming up in a few weeks. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me again. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.